Continuing on from the previous lecture, this is the part two of your chemistry lecture. We're going to start off with the nonmetals and their characteristics. So nonmetals are poor conductors of electricity. They're brittle, which means they break easily. And most of them are gases at room temperature. So prime time example of that would be carbon. Another would be oxygen. Um, any of your, pretty much any of your noble gases. So your eighth group um, would be examples of nonmetals. Halogens are the group before last. They have seven valence electrons, so they are very reactive. They're never found pure in nature because they are so reactive, and they must be diatomic molecules to be found pure. Diatomic molecules means that there has to be two of them in existence. So, for instance, chlorine wouldn't just be Cl and that's it. In nature, for it to be stable, it would be two atoms of chlorine. That's what diatomic molecules mean. So it would be CL2 if you ever saw it in nature. That's the only way they could actually be, um, be found because of the fact that they are reactive. That's one of the reasons why they want to bond with other things like, for instance, sodium. Okay, because when they do that, they end up having that ionic bond. They are gaining an electron from sodium and it's keeping them both stable. Your noble gases is the very last row, okay, it's uh, not very last row, very last column. It's where you have the least reactive, actually probably even where they have no reaction at all, they're not as reactive um, because of the fact that they're happy, okay. They have all eight valence electrons in their outer shell, which follows the octet rule, okay. The only exception would be helium. And helium only has two of those electrons, but that's all it needs because it only has that first energy level. And so it meets it meets the octet rule because it's happy, but there's not eight there. Um, every other one would need the eight um, electrons. Uh, they are the only ones that are found pure in nature, and they're not reactive. Like I said before, they're colorless and odorless. Most gases are. The only reason why we do smell anything when uh, we have a gas leak is because uh, by law they actually have to put something inside of it to make it have um, a nasty smell to it. So that way to warn people that there's a gas leak somewhere because we can't see it and normally it's odorless. So you would end up with people who would be dying of some kind of gas poisoning without it. Um, these were all the last of the elements to actually be found, and that's why they're placed where they are in the periodic table. They're the last period, um, the last group. So, okay, valence electrons. This is where we start talking about the octet rule and why certain elements are, you know, are more reactive than others and why they would want to be happier. It's based off of these valence electrons. So, as you can see in the graphic here, okay, the valence electrons are going to be the electrons in the outermost shell. So, those red electrons right there are your outermost shell. And this one has four. That means that it could go ahead and either share those four, okay, or it would end up giving up one or giving up all four, um, so this is definitely one that's probably going to be looking for another element of some sort to be able to latch on or more than one of those other elements to latch on. So then that way they would have eight in that outer shell that you see there. Okay, so based on your periodic table, it'll tell you how many valence electrons you have available. So group one, where we have the alkali metals, has one valence electron. Group two has two valence electrons. Group 13, because you would have to look all the way, so that's passing through all the transition metals and then going up, okay, has three valence electrons available for bonding. Group 14 has four valence electrons. 15 has five, 16 has six, 17 has seven, and 18 has eight, but they are not available to share because that means the octet rule. They have all that they need. So those are the ones that aren't reactive and they're happy as can be. No problem. Transition elements, okay, that section right in the middle, they have one to two valence electrons. It kind of depends on what um, 
what element it is that we're talking about. And then the F block at the bottom, the lanthanides, um, that little piece that kind of comes out of your periodic table, also have one to two valence electrons and it varies depending on which element it is that we're, we're talking about. So bonds are forces that hold groups of atoms together and make them function as a unit. And you guys saw this already. This is one of your vocab words. We have ionic bonds, which give up electrons, and they can either give up or gain electrons, so it's both. And then you have covalent bonds, which share the electrons. Okay, the covalent bonds are really the strongest bonds that we have, um, and they're very, very hard to pull apart. More than likely, to pull apart a covalent bond, you would have to be in a nuclear lab where um, they can do things like that with heavy machinery and specialized equipment especially safety equipment, because you can have some very violent reactions. There's a lot of energy stored in those bonds. The weakest bond that there is is not listed here, but it's a hydrogen bond. And surprisingly, it's the bond that holds our DNA together. All right, which brings up an interesting point as to, well, you know, DNA is so essential for our life. Why would we have hydrogen bonds holding our DNA together? And that's something that you'll get into when we, you know, when we talk about DNA or when you get into biology um, because it, they need to break down in order for us to go through DNA replication and continue being the species that we are. So that's just some food for thought for you guys to think about. Okay, so ionic bonds um, are the first, it's the first type of bond we're going to talk about. Okay, you have what's called a cation which is one of your vocab words, is a positively charged ion, meaning that that element gave up an electron to someone else, to another element. So now they have a positive charge. Okay, an anion would be a negatively charged ion, meaning they picked up and they gained an electron from someone. So for instance, sodium would be a cation because it gives up an electron, and chloride would be an anion because it gains an electron. Um, and these things happen because in ionic bonds, atoms give up or gain the electrons in order to fill the outer energy shell. And this is, again, to uh, satisfy the octet rule. Metals tend to lose electrons to become positively charged. Nonmetals tend to gain the electrons to become negatively charged. So using the previous example of sodium and chloride, sodium is considered a metal where chloride is a nonmetal. And the two of them together in that ionic bond gives us table salt. When writing ionic formulas, you need to write them with the charges and make sure that they are balanced, okay? Um, you Because it's an ionic bond, you have to write them with the charges, and you always want to make sure that your formulas are balanced, uh, because then if not, when you write them, something's going to end up being more positive or more negative, and in a laboratory setting, that can make a, a major difference. When you name ionic compounds, the cation goes first and then the anion. So the cation would be sodium. And then, as you see here in the little bullet there, it says the anion normally will end in the suffix "-ide". So even though it's a sodium and an, a chlorine element coming together, when it's together, it officially becomes sodium chloride. So a covalent bond, like I said, is one of the strongest bonds that we have. And in this situation, it's because the electrons are shared. No one's giving anything up. No one's gaining anything. They're like, hey, you know, you're missing one. I'm missing one. Why don't we just share them together? Um, and that ends up being the strongest bond that we have. This is only with nonmetals. Okay, so it makes sense as to why hydrogen and oxygen binding together to make water ends up being a covalent bond. The term molecule is exclusively used for covalent bonding. So compounds are when we have two or more elements combined, but molecule is specifically only for covalent bonds. So you cannot call an ionic bond a, uh, a molecule. It, that's just not how it works. You have to call a, mo a molecule is for a covalent bond. They follow the same rules about satisfying the octet rule, which is needing to fill that last electron shell. Uh, fluorine is one that will give up its electrons to anyone, so it'll hook up to anybody it can. 
Uh, when writing or representing them, bonds can be represented by dots, as you see there with like the two semicolons, or with dashes. And that's when you do like a whole uh, chemical uh, formula, a chemical structure when you're writing it out. Those are uh, Niels Bohr's models that you'll see there. Hydrogens and halogens form one covalent bond because they have one valent electron. Oxygen and sulfur will form two covalent bonds as it'll either be one double bond or two single bonds. Nitrogen and phosphorus form three covalent bonds, so they'll either have one triple bond, two double, and one single, or three single bonds altogether. And then carbon and silicon will form four covalent bonds, and that's because of the fact that they have four valence electrons available. So these are your Lewis structures for covalent bonds. So as you can see there, you have the dots on the outside. Those dots represent the electrons that are there. And then you have the dashes there, and that represents the fact that there is a covalent bond in place so that they're actually sharing those electrons. And so to correct myself from earlier, it is a Lewis structure, not a Bohr's model structure. So forming covalent bonds, you can follow this graphic here. All right, if they're if the easiest way is to always make your dots around the element and then say, oh, well, you know, which one is, only has one and then put the dots together. And when you have two dots close to each other that are between two different elements, you go ahead and you can substitute a dash for that and it makes it a little more easy to see what it is that you're doing so the first one there is actually forming the covalent bond for water so if you have any questions you guys know that you can go ahead and hit the remind 101 app send a question or you can just keep reviewing this lecture and the first lecture for chemistry